Hey everyone, how you doing? Thanks for coming out today. Um, this is, my name is Joe, this is Adib, and uh, this is our first time at DevOx in Belgium. And uh, really happy to be here. We're really thankful for the organizers for allowing us the opportunity to present today. Thank you. And uh, I'm just going to do a little intro myself. Like I said, my name is Joe Granger. I'm a core committer on the Spring Security Framework. Uh, I've been working pretty, pretty focused on the OAuth and OpenID Connect support the last, I think we started this journey about two years ago. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, um, Spring Security OAuth, Legacy OAuth, we call it. It's been around for five or six years. There's OAuth and Spring Boot and um, 1.5, that is, and the, the old OAuth and Spring Social, a little bit fragmented. So this journey started two years ago where we're basically rewriting OAuth, OpenID Connect support within, within and bringing it into Spring Security proper and just ultimately unifying it into one project. So. Um, we're going to be presenting a lot of the features that we've been building the last two years. Um, a lot of my background is from the financial industry. I've been consulting, but the last two years I've been on the Spring Security team working hard on this. So I'm going to let Deeb introduce himself too. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for, uh, for being here. Um, so my name is Adib Saikali. I'm part of the platform architecture team at Pivotal. What that basically means is I spend all my time on site with customers, helping them actually figure out how to build microservices and do this for real. Typical things I end up doing is, here's our two million line Java application. It's a big giant monolith. Help us come up with a plan for how to actually turn this into microservices. And of course, what everybody wants to talk about is security in all those situations. So I've been seeing it more on the end user side of things for the past uh, few years. And that's me. Right on. Um, before we kind of get into this, um, we just want to gauge the audience, just the level of um, experience with o OAuth and OpenID Connect. If I could get a raise of hands, um, who has used OAuth 2? Perfect. So you're at the right place. How about OpenID Connect? Okay. And who has used Spring Security for at least, let's say, three years, just more? Okay. And how about like five years or more? Okay. How about who hasn't used Spring Security? Okay, right on. How, and how about uh, who has used um, the OAuth 2 client features, OAuth 2 login, and the new client features in 5.1? Okay, so you're, you're, we're going to show you a lot today. How about um, the, the resource server support that we introduced in 5.1? Okay, you guys are going to see a lot today. Great, so you're definitely at the right place. Um, I'm going to let Adib start things off, and then we'll get into some demos. Great. Uh, thanks, Joe. So we're assuming you're here because you want to build secure cloud-native applications. And like a lot of uh, folks and developers, when you look in the security toolbox, you find all sorts of tools there, uh, things like OAuth 2, OpenID Connect, Jot Token, SAML, Kerberos, all sorts of things. And it can feel a little bit confusing, like what tool should I reach for, for what situations? And so there's always the danger of using, uh, to be confused and use the wrong tool for the job. So our goal today from this deep dive is to kind of help you organize a security toolbox. So we assume you actually know absolutely nothing about OAuth 2 or OpenID Connect or Spring. You can just read Java code. That's all you really need to actually get everything there is to get today. So for those of you who are already old hands at OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect and some of this technology, there's going to be some review. Our goal is to package it up all into, you know, and organize it nicely. So that's what we're uh, our plan for the day. This will enable us to do two things. One is it's going to help you figure out how to build those secure applications. And the more important goal today is we want to be able to work better with InfoSec. Uh, who's had to deal with an InfoSec team here? Raise your hand. OK, keep your hand up if you enjoyed that experience. <laughs> Okay, there's one hand that, got, that stayed up there. Uh, so this is, you know, traditionally InfoSec teams believe that developers are the biggest security risk in the company because they can easily, you know, make a, like implement some code that's suspect to a vulnerability of some kind from, you know, SQL injection to just plain doing bad things like, uh, you know, writing out passwords to log files, right? Um, so our goal is to give you enough background that you can work better with your InfoSec team um, and that's that's a primary goal of today. So what our plan is, 
is to explore security patterns and protocols through a series of use cases with examples uh, on how to implement them with Spring Security 5. So the way it's going to basically work is I'm going to do all the slides. Joe is going to do all the code. Um, and uh, that's, that's the division of labor today. So I've got the easy job. Um, so the first kind of pattern we want to talk about is don't trust apps with user credentials. What do we mean by this? Uh, very simply, I'd say, how many people here have implemented uh, something in Spring Security or others where you wrote the code that brought up the login screen at some point in your career? I expect a good chunk of you. And that's what we you know, typically reach out for when we're building a web app security. Uh, this is very easy to implement with, uh, with Spring Security, user detail service, you know, form login. Uh, it really is, once you've done it a couple of times, not, not a lot of effort. However, there's a problem with this, which is we're actually trusting the application with the username and password. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, we have access to a set of database tables that has this. So if we implement a, a feature insecurely anywhere in our application, it's possible that uh, people will be able to do a SQL injection attack and say, you know, steal all our user data and or delete all our user data and or do other bad stuff to our system. Um, so, it, it, go, it gets a bit more problematic, too, because most companies have more than one application. And if you have more than one application, how do you actually do single sign-on across multiple apps? So since this is 2018, we don't want to do this anymore. There are better alternatives. So what we would kind of want to do is something that is uh, uses OpenID Connect and or an SSO server. So in this example, as you can see, um, can you guys see my mouse moving around when I move it here? Or is there a lag? It's all good? OK, perfect. So we've got our app one. Uh, it's got its own app server that's implementing it. It's got its own uh, database. But when we want to log in, we want to redirect people to our OpenID Connect server, where they're going to be presented with the login screen. Now, this login screen from the OpenID Connect server can do fancy things like two-factor authentication, which you should be doing. And you don't want to have to go figure out how to, do, to implement that yourself, you know, the place where you get an SMS message with a code and or you're using like something like the Google Authenticator or some sort of push notification mechanism. Um, same thing, app two, when, when it wants to log in, it's going to redirect you to the OpenID Connect server. Um, now, this is uh, uh, great because our application does not need to see the user credentials anymore. Only the OpenID Connect server needs to see the user credentials. Uh, it's also quite easy to implement in Spring Security. Uh, Joe's going to show that in a, in a few minutes, and I think you'll probably see that it's a lot easier than implementing form login. Uh, what's interesting about it is that you're going to have to get your hands on an OpenID Connect server somehow, some way. And we'll talk about where you can get one of those uh, shortly. Uh, there are different ways of doing uh, um, uh, uh, like SSO, some of the kind of established protocols are like SAML, Kerberos. Um, and we'll talk about how to integrate with those a little bit later on uh, in the presentation. Um, so uh, with that said, how do I go about getting my hands on an OpenID Connect server? Now, as developers, uh, we can always kind of use some sort of cloud-hosted solution. There's quite a bit of those. Uh, you guys may have used things like Okta or Auth0 or Stormpath or any number of hosted online things. There's other uh, kind of offline tools that are open source implementations like uh, the UAA from Cloud Foundry or Keycloak or, or many other uh, uh, open source technologies. We're going to demonstrate our samples today with uh, the UAA, which is a Spring-based uh, OpenID Connect server. Uh, it is, doesn't have an administrative console. It has a, a CLI for the administrative stuff. And it's really designed to be embedded inside your application. So it's quite trivial to actually launch it. Let me actually quickly demo that. Uh, so what we've got here in the sample application, uh, I'm going to just basically ask Gradle to go and run the UAA for me. And once that launches, um, I'll take you through what actually had to happen for this to, to be so simple. So if I go now to my back to my browser, go to localhost 8090, <coughs> ah, forward slash UAA, that's right. So I'm going to end up at the, at the login screen. And uh, uh, I can log in with something like user1 and password. Uh, 
Okay, and now it's going to basically say, oh, where do you want to go? We don't have any registered apps. This is really set up for a developer laptop as opposed to something that you would deploy to production. Uh, I can go here and I can see what my account settings, change my password, you know, forget, uh, send a, get it to send me an email like, hey, you forgot your password. Can you reset it? All the typical kind of stuff. Uh, so as a developer, what do I have to do to make this work? In our uh, sample repo, which uh, you guys ha all have access to, uh, we have a project called uh, UAA Server. Inside of that, there is a, a YAML file. And this YAML file is what's used to kind of configure uh, this UAA. Uh, typically, OpenID Connect servers need a database of some kind. This, the way we're setting it up here is that we're just using H2 out of the box. If you don't tell it anything, it just uses H2. So it's very easy for us to just ask it to, uh, to launch. It is published to Maven Central as a war file. So all you need to do is either use uh, Maven Cargo Run or the equivalent of that in Gradle. Uh, in the config file, uh, you can specify, for example, here's our list of users. So this is where I logged in. Joe will get into a bit more of the details about how uh, what this is as he covers different uh, uh, use cases and how to implement them in uh, in, uh, in Spring Security Five. All right, so, so that is pretty much it for how we get our hands on that from the build.gradle. If you just want to see what that looks like, uh, you can see we're grabbing a uh, Tomcat eight point five, and we're uh, we're resolving the specific UAA war file from. Um, uh, from Maven Central, and then using that to uh, to launch it on that Tomcat server. So any questions about how to get your hands on an OpenID Connect server for development? All right, I guess not. So Joe, you're on. So I'll turn it over to Joe, and he's <coughs> going to uh, show you how to actually, uh, what you need to do to code an OpenID Connect login with uh, Spring Security 5. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of steps. I'm just going to do a high level um, steps on what we got to do to configure the, the client application, the OAuth application, or the application that is using OAuth client to go through um, the OpenID Connect flow authentication, right? So the first step is, First, we got to configure the client with the provider. So whether you're using UAA or Google or GitHub or LinkedIn, you got to go there to the developer console, the developer API, and register a client. All right, that's the first step. The result of that, you get client credentials, your client ID, client secret. Now, um, Spring Security um, 5.0 implemented OAuth 2 login, which is an implementation of OpenID Connect, and we're leveraging the authorization code grant. So as part of that registration is you got to register the redirect URI. That's the URI that you get redirected back to the application with the authorization code, right? So we could exchange it for an access token. So that's a critical piece of information um, when you're registering the client with the provider. After that, the next step is we're gonna to go to the application, right? We have the client ID, client secret, we've registered the re redirect URI, we'll go now to the application and we're gonna add the dependencies. For the dependencies is obviously the Spring Boot Starter Security and the OAuth2 client. So the OAuth2 client dependency, that imports OAuth2 client, OAuth2 core, and OAuth2 Jose, um, which basically is required to validate the signature of the ID token during the OpenID Connect authentication. And then the third part is now we're gonna configure the application YAML, we're gonna configure the client registration um, and, uh, and the provider details, which I'm gonna show you next. That's pretty much from a really high level, those are the steps. So let's take a look at the actual, um, the code and see how that, how we actually go about and do, how, how we go about and do that. So the first thing is, and Adib already showed you this, is we have, Okay, that's good. You guys could see that. We have, a, we have this client here in UAA. So this is already registered, right? Imagine I was already at a console, you know, the Google console or UAA. I registered the client here. I'm just adding it in the configuration, right? But the key things here that I want to point out is the login client. So that's the client ID. I've just given it that name. Secret is the, the client secret. And there's that redirect URI. So as you can see here, the redirect URI follows this 
standard pattern, login OAuth2 code, right? That is basically, a, there's a Spring Security filter, the OAuth2 login filter that matches on that request. The last path in that request is login client. That's the registration ID. I'm gonna get into that, into those details, but that ultimately picks the client that's configured in the application and uses that client registration metadata to perform the OAuth2 uh, or the OpenID Connect authentication, right? So that's the first thing. So there, you know, on the client you register, or on the provider you register your clients, right? Now, um, so we have we have this sample app, and uh, we have the application YAML here. I'm going to zoom this up. So the first thing is, is the base property prefix for, for OAuth2 client is spring security OAuth2 client. That's the base property prefix for OAuth2 client functionality, right? Now the first thing I want to show you is provider. So OAuth2 client dot provider, right? That's the base property prefix to configure provider metadata. So provider metadata as in, I mean, the two key protocol endpoints are the authorization endpoint and the protocol endpoint, right? The authorization endpoint where the OAuth client redirects the user or the agent to the OpenID Connect provider saying, you know, uh, log me in, right? And that's where the user's not logged in with the provider, you'll log in with Google or UAA and at that point you'll get the consent screen, right? And I'm gonna demo that in a bit. Um, and you get the consent screen, so do you authorize this application to access my user information, email and so forth. So that's the authorization endpoint. Um, the token endpoint is that callback URL, the redirect URL, when, it, when, it, when the user has authorized the, the, the application to, author, to, to access its protected resources, the user information, um, the authorization code gets redirected back from the provider to the user agent, to the application, to the redirect URI, right? Reads that code and then it calls the token endpoint right, to exchange the code for an access token, right? So now the OAuth client has an access token, now it has to get more information. At this point it has the access token and an ID token, right? Because that's, that's that extra security token, the OAuth security token that's part of OpenID Connect. You know, you got the access token through the authorization code flow, but you also get an ID token. And the ID token, and that's why they call the client the relying party because the, the, the client relies on the ID token to authenticate the user into the application. That ID token has certain claims in there, issuer, subject, so the subject is the identifier of the user at the provider, um, and there's, there's some other claims there as well. And it's signed, right, so verifies the signature and then the client authenticates. But we could also do an extra call to the user info endpoint to get more information. So you saw those those scopes there um, configured, open I, or profile and email. I'm, I'll get to that top in a bit, um, but I want to get some more information so I could authenticate the user, create the principal with more information, right? When I'm authenticating, so that's the user info endpoint. JWK set URI, like I was saying, that's where you get the public keys from the provider to verify the signature of the ID token. So that's the provider um, details. Now, client, so we have login client. As you can see here, I've given, the, I've given it the same name. I've given it the same name as on the provider. Um, and you see the client ID, client secret, login client secret. But the key thing I wanna point out here is security auth to client registration, that next part in that property path is the registration ID, just the logical name Right, and I'm gonna talk about client registration, that central class within OAuth2 client later on, but the one thing I wanted to point out is the registration ID, right? That's a unique identifier of that client registration within this application, right? That's used in certain spots as I demonstrated in the redirect URI, right? At the provider, I actually had login OAuth2 code slash login client. That's how it picks, right? It uses that last path to find the registration ID, right? 
Um, the other, the other uh, piece of metadata here, authorization code, that's, that's what we're leveraging for OpenID to connect. There's other grant types, but we're leveraging the authorization code. And then I set uh, uh, the scope, OpenID profile email, so I get some inf extra information from the user info endpoints. So that's, that's pretty much what we got to do on a client application as far as configuration goes. And, uh, and then the next step is I'm going to do it. I'm going to do a demo, right? That's, this is pretty much it. The one thing I wanted to point out too, actually, is, uh, is I got this in the DSL. So everyone's familiar with the web security configurer adapter. Everyone's been using Spring security for a while. I, I've seen that. So that's great. So you're, conf you're familiar with this. Um, so on the, the OAuth2 login DSL, we have a login page, as you can see there. Um, the login page, and I'm referencing OAuth2 authorization login client. So to trigger, to trigger um, OpenID Connect authentication within the application, there's a filter that's looking for this base property path, slash OAuth2, slash authorization, slash registration ID. So if I configured a specific client registration strictly for OpenID Connect, which is indicated by the scope parameter OpenID, because that scope is required to trigger OpenID authentication. So I've configured a client that has OpenID in the scope um, in the scope property, and then I set my login page to login client so that it can automatically trigger the authentication. Because if you don't do that, and you got multiple client registrations um, configured, then you'll just get a default login page displaying the cl client registrations, and you would have to click which one you want to use to authenticate. So I've just configured this one extra thing because I want to automatically trigger authentication when I hit localhost 8080. That's it. So basically, properties, Login page configuration, and I'm done. Right, so let's try this. Let's 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 do a quick demo and authenticate with the application. Okay, I got to start the application. That'll, that'll help. <laughs> All right, and I, I might as well start the other services as well while I'm in the process. We got uh, we got a UI app and three microservices. In this, and I'm going to dive into all that as I as I do a series of demos today. Okay, so here we go. So as you can see in the URL, I've been redirected to UAA 8090, right? UAA login, right? So this is basically the authorization endpoint, like I was talking about. I'm going to log in. So and here's the consent screen, right? I've logged in. Um, now it's asking for login client. Do you, do you authorize login client to access my user information, email and address? So I'm going to authorize. When I click on this, the authorization code back goes back to the OAuth2 login authentication filter with the code, reads the code, calls a token endpoint, exchanges it for an access token, calls the user info endpoint, and displays this information on the top right, first one, last one, right? So that's my user, my first name, and last name that's, that came back from the user info endpoint. So that's it, right? So that's, bi that's pretty much it to implement OpenID Connect Authentication with Spring Security 5. That, that was introduced in 5, is property files configuration, well, register your client, property files configuration, and you're pretty much done, right? So that's it. Now, if I wanted to, if I wanted to, access the currently authenticated user, right? So I've authenticated, and as you're all familiar, in the security context, there's an authentication instance, right, for, for the currently authenticated user. If I wanted to access my information, my OpenID Connect user representation, how can I do that in code? Let me show that to you. So we'll go into the UI app here and and we will take a look at one of the controllers here. Um, we could even just look at the, this controller device. And this is how you would access it. I'm going to just minimize that. As you can see here, I have a controller device. This is exactly the bit of code that displays the first name, last name, right? Is <clears throat> all requests that come here, I'm basically just storing you know, a user model object into the model so I could render it on, on the page. 
and I'm resolving it through the, you know, the authentication principle annotation, which has been around with Spring Security since, I don't know, four or something like that. And ultimately what that does is it gets the authentication from the security context and does get principle on the authentication. That's what that annotation does, right? So the, the OAuth2, the actual authentication instance in the security context is OAuth2 authentication token. The principle in that authentication token is OIDC user for an OpenID Connect authentication because we also um, support non-OpenID Connect providers like GitHub and Facebook, and that would be an OAuth2 user um, instance instead. But we're gonna, we're just talking about OpenID Connect, so this is how you would resolve it, right? Pretty simple. Now, to get the information, so now I could do all sorts of stuff. In here, I have all the claims, right? The, the claims there, get claims, that will return all the claims from the user info endpoint and the ID token, right? So an aggregate of the two. And obviously we have, um, we could access just strictly the user information where we got like first name, last name, email address and so forth, and the ID token, right? So this is how you would access the currently authenticated principle, okay? Are there any questions before I jump to the next? Crystal clear? Is it easy? Nice, nice. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yes, Adib. Uh, um, can you show us the dependencies you had to add to the class path? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. So we'll go to the build grade also right here. Is basically the Spring Boot Starter Security and then the OAuth2 client. Right, that's it. Those are the only two. Right, and obviously your your standard starters web, and I'm using ThymeLeaf in this application. Okay, um, Adib, I'm going to hand it over to you to to go to the next uh, the next set of slides here, and we will. There you go. go cool. So I hope you guys saw that that was pretty easy. Uh, just a quick show of hands: who is now believing what I said earlier? that implementing OpenID Connect login is less work than implementing uh, user details server service and form login in Spring. Raise your hand if you can believe it. All right, Joe, you should see this. Everybody, lots of people putting their hands up. Cool. So, uh, so now you're going to say to me, great, so you showed me that writing an OpenID Connect uh, user uh, login is pretty simple, but my company has LDAP. My company has SAML. My company has something that is not OpenID Connect, what do I do in this case? Well, the answer is that uh, the, a lot of the OpenID Connect servers act as a bridge. So for example, you can take the UAA and you can configure it in that YAML config file and other places to say, can you please like, you know, log in via LDAP? Can you please log in the users via SAML? Uh, so as a programming model, you can actually, for 2018 moving forward, you can actually just settle on using OpenID Connect and, uh, and then use the OpenID Connect infrastructure to bridge to other existing uh, security infrastructure you might have in your enterprise. Um, and uh, you know, as simple as that is, there's, we wanna take a little bit, go under the hood right now. So if writing the login was, was pretty easy, what was actually making it work? What are the, the protocols and the standards that underpin the OpenID Connect? Uh, and so this is a quick kind of uh, layer cake of what are the standards that are involved. So at the bottom is uh, the JSON web algorithms and JSON web key. On top of that, we've got web signature and web encryption. On top of that, we've got the JSON web token. And that collection of standards is, is referred to as the JavaScript object signing and encryption suite of, of RFCs, which is called Jose. There's also on top of that OAuth2, and on top of that is OpenID Connect. So what I want to do is kind of rapid fire go through a whole bunch of these uh, um, uh, standards so to help you understand A, what they are, give you the background, and how they work. Uh, it turns out that the, the Jose standards are actually quite useful even outside of the context of OAuth2 and OpenID Connect. So let's start from the beginning. So at the bottom, we've got this thing called JSON web algorithm. Let's focus on what is the problem that this solves. If I send any of you an encrypted message, you would need to know 
what encryption algorithm I picked to encrypt the message in order to be able to decode my message. Uh, so any system that's exchanging data that involves cryptographic algorithms needs need to agree on which algorithms are, are used. So effectively what this standard is, it is a list of strings that identify specific algorithms. So for example, if you see HS256, it means that it refers to the hashed methods authentication code with secure hashing algorithm that outputs a fixed 256-bit hash. Okay, do you need to know as a developer how to implement that algorithm? No. However, you can use that string to configure whatever library you're using. So if you're writing your code in Java, you'd configure your Java crypto libraries to say, please use this algorithm. Uh, if you're using Node.js, you'd configure your Node.js libraries to use that algorithm. So it is, so JWA is quite useful for anybody needing to precisely talk about which algorithm was picked. Uh, there's actually an IANA registry, which is a table online, and it specifies the standard string names. So you can see on the left-hand hand side the algorithm names, the description of the algorithm. You can see whether it's required. If you say that you're implementing the Jose uh, standards, does it is it required or optional? It also uh, tells you, uh, um, uh, you know, whoops. I'm just going to quickly go here. This is my be this is the best part. Uh, it tells you what's prohibited. So as algorithms kind of go out of, uh, not out of fashion, but as people discover vulnerabilities in them and they crack them, you can, you can reference this table to say, what are the things that are recommended versus the things that we now know have become insecure? Uh, so why, how would you actually use this just for your own purposes? Uh, so let's say you're building a medical images application and you're taking x-rays of, of things. And you're going to take that x-ray picture and you're going to th uh, throw it onto an S3 bucket on AWS, but you'd like to encrypt it first. And so you might have a database table somewhere where you're actually recording the image ID, uh, which bucket you put it on, and which algorithm you used in order to encrypt it. So it's just metadata about what you're using. So this way, if a Java application wrote it to... Uh, to the bucket and a Node.js application wants to read it, the Node.js can figure out which algorithm to use to decrypt it. Okay. Again, as a developer, I don't need to know, like I can see A256 GCM stands for the, you know, the advanced encryption standard with Galloway counter mode using 256-bit key. Do I need to know anything about how to implement that algorithm? No. Uh, would I have worked with my InfoSec team and my InfoSec team would have told me, hey, Adib, this is a list of the approved ciphers, ciphers that we should be using. And I would just use those in, uh, in my app. Um, similarly, the JSON web key is a standard for exchanging cryptographic information. Who's had fun here uh, working with .pem files or .jks files? or .der files. Who's been confused about those file formats? And you're like, what's the command that I type? <laughs> uh, so uh, this kind of gets to all of these existing formats, JKS, DER, PKCS, all these things are, are methods for uh, exchanging cryptographic key information. What JWK does is it basically says, we're going to let you represent your keys as a JSON object. So for example, you can see at the bottom, the, the JSON object there says it's a, an elliptic curve key, uh, and it specifies the x, y coordinate and what curve it is. Um, so if I'm writing code that's exchanging cryptographic information, similarly to my previous uh, example with the, uh, with the uh, you know, x-ray images, I could use store my keys as uh, JSON objects in the database. So that kind of covers the bottommost uh, layer of, of the standard stack. The next one up is JSON Web Signature, which is basically a data, it's a way for you to answer two questions about a piece of JSON. If somebody hands you a piece of JSON, you can ask two questions of it. One, has this JSON been tampered with since I've received it, but before I got it? And the second question that you can answer with it is who actually created that JSON object? Now these are two very useful properties uh, which you get by just tra traditionally using 
digital signature algorithms. So what does this look like? It looks something like this. When you have a JSON web signature, you have a header. The header is a JSON object, and it indicates what type of algorithm is going to be used for the signature of the, uh, of the object. Okay? Uh, you have a payload, and the, Java, the, the JWS standard says it's an arbitrary JSON object. It has no standard fields. It can be whatever you want it to be. Um, and then you have the signature. So for example, you could take this and you can, let's say, making an application, let's say you work for an insurance company, and you have an application for people to use their phone to take photos of the damage. Maybe their house was flooded or their car was uh, in a car crash or something like that. And you want to be able to now uh, you know, uh, take the photos, uh, put them together, take the GPS coordinates, take the ID of the phone, munge it all into one giant thing, digitally sign it, and then represent and say, in a legal court of law, this was not modified after it was given to us. That's where you might want to leverage some of the stuff like the JSON web signature. So we take this, and then we take the first part of the JSON web signature, and uh, we'll base64 URL encode the header. Uh, and then we'll put a dot, and then we base64 URL encode the payload, and then we put a dot, and then we'll base64 URL encode the signature and put a dot. What that will do is it will give us a single string that we can include inside of URL parameters, inside of HTTP headers, inside of, say, like a message header in a RabbitMQ message, or practically anywhere where we need to compactly uh, exchange this uh, actual signed object over the network. Um, and we don't have to do any kind of character escaping. So in, in summary, JWS is, is quite useful for anybody working with uh, digital signatures and wants to use that with JSON objects within the context of OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. It's useful, and also elsewhere. So what? let's just see a really quick example of actually validating this. So I'll go back here to uh, the sample application. Oh, I think we ran this in debug mode. Interesting. OK, so I'm going to click here. I'm going to, Joe will explain this in a little bit more detail. But uh, I'm going to take the actual access token that I got from, uh, from my OpenID Connect service. I'm going to copy it. And you can usually, if you, if you haven't played with this, you can try like a website like jot.io, uh, where I can take this, I can paste it. Take the last part out. There's refresh token in the bottom there. Yeah. Oh, thank you. No worries. OK, so you can see here, because it's a, it's a signature, I'm able, to, um, I'm able to decode it. I can tell which algorithm was used. Uh, I can read the content of the payload. So I'm not securing that content. And it detected that this was a. Uh, base64 encoded, uh, uh, sorry, it's, a, uh, uh, it's RSA, so I need, I need my public key to check whether the signature is valid or not. So where do I get my public key from? Uh, this is where I can go to my uh, UAA endpoint, and I can say localhost 8090 forward slash UAA forward slash token underscore, I think it's keys. OK, and now I'm, I'm hitting my OpenID Connect server, and I'm able to read an array of, remember that JWK thing I talked about the, the, that represents the keys? This is what I'm able to read from that. And this thing here has my public key. Right? And so I can take this public key, and I can copy and paste it into jot.io, and I'll be able to uh, actually um, validate it. So let's actually see that. This thing has a bunch of new lines in here that are tripping up jot.io. So I'm going to copy and paste it instead from the UAA YAML here. Yeah, I got it. So this is the public key of the UAA that it was using to, to sign things. So I just do Command C, go to this guy over here. 
and boom, signature verify. So this is also a fairly interesting property in that when I receive a JSON uh, web signature, I can actually check that it wasn't tampered with without having to go back to the server that issued it to check whether somebody has modified it. All right? Comments, questions? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry? Um, let's take that one offline. Thank you. Okay. Um, any questions about the concept of what a JWS is? Yeah, cool. Uh, so that covers the, the, that part of it. So the, naturally, the web encryption part is going to be, okay, great, I've got this payload and anybody can read it, but what if I actually want to protect the payload? So now what we do is we actually encrypt the payload, which is a JSON object. And it, we do the same base 64 URL type encoding. Uh, it just is longer than it would be if it was, if it was a web signature. Uh, for the same exact use case where you could just use it to store content in your database, you can use the JSON web encryption uh, for that. So uh, looking at this diagram, what is a JSON web token? It's either a web signature or a web encryption uh, uh, object. And it's, that's really all there is to it. So when you see a JWT token, it could either be encrypted or it could be just signed. Um, and uh, it also basically says, great, if I'm exchanging these types of tokens, there might be certain standard fields I want to include. Uh, maybe I want to indicate the ID of the token. That's typically called, the field is called JTI. Uh, I might want to say what time the token was issued, uh, um, which is in, called IAT or ISS, who issued the URL of the server that issued the token, or NBF. This is a token that's not valid right now. It's going to be valid at a future time. At what point does this token become valid? Uh, EXP, what time does the token expire? SUB, which is the uh, unique ID of the user that represents this token. So it's like the user ID, basically. And then finally, there's a very important field called audience. Audience is an incredibly important field. I want to talk just a little bit about it. Imagine a situation where you have two APIs. Uh, one API is for locating the nearest ATM, and another API is for um, uh, doing a money transfer. Okay, so you have an application, it goes, it gets a token uh, from the OpenID Connect server to, um, to call the locate nearest ATM. So you have a perfectly valid token. Somebody takes that token and says, great, let me actually now call the uh, money transfer API with the token that was intended for the look up the nearest ATM. And if the money transfer service doesn't check that this token was intended for it, it just says, is this token valid? Is it not expired? Then you would end up <laughs> transferring money when you shouldn't. So the audience field is a place where you can say, who does this token, who should be using this token? And when you receive a token, you can check to see if this is intended for you. Uh, and that's, that's part of the validation you use to kind of build up the higher level uh, security protocols. So once we have this, uh, this JWS token, uh, what we can do, for example, you can, you can send an HTTP request. There's an authorization header. And then you can just say bearer and then the name of the, the actual content of the token. Uh, we're going to scare you later on at the end of the presentation about uh, some of the, the, the challenges of working with bearer tokens. Uh, so uh, just understand it's kind of very easy to work with. And uh, uh, that's why a lot of people use it. Uh, we could also take the token and we could stick it into a header for an HT, uh, for like a rabbit MQ message uh, and or like a JMS message. And that's your uh, JavaScript Jose set of standards. Questions about this collection of standards at all? Okay. Thank you. All right, cool. So next is, uh, you're probably wondering, is there something in Spring Security that's actually going to help me work directly with those, uh, with those standards? I want to create my own JWS tokens. I want to decode them. Uh, I want to encrypt them. There is a uh, Spring Security OAuth 2 Jose module, but it, it's built on top of the Nimbus uh, open source library. Uh, and there's an interface, uh, a class called Shot Decoder, 
which is what can be used to decode, decode a JWS, verify the signature, uh, validate what's in the claim set, and uh, you know, it doesn't do JWE today, that is on the roadmap, um, but it's really built for use by Spring Security. So if you wanna do your own stuff with, with Jose, we recommend you just use Nimbus or some alternative to Nimbus. Uh, which takes us to now, okay, so we covered the foundational um, uh, set of, uh, of standards. What's OAuth 2? What is it actually doing for you? A lot of people think that OAuth 2 is for logging people in. It is not. OAuth 2 is for authorizing uh, and asking humans permission if it's okay to do something. Uh, OAuth 2 also doesn't specify a particular token format. You can actually do what's called opaque tokens with it. Uh, and so you don't have to use JOT, you don't have to use JWS, and it's really designed uh, for other frameworks to extend it. In fact, if you read through the RFC, it'll say clearly in there, this framework was designed with the clear expectation that future work will define prescriptive profiles and extensions necessary to achieve full web scale interoperability. So we're always gonna be using OAuth 2, probably in the context of OpenID Connect or some sort of other extension to it. There are four key concepts you want to understand about OAuth. These are going to show up in the documentation. So if you're looking through the Spring 5 uh, security documentation, you're going to see it talk about a resource server and a resource owner and a client. You, you already saw that in the configuration file. Client ID, client secret. Uh, you're going to see authorization server, authorization URI, redirect URI. So if you understand those four concepts, then you can understand what the documentation has to say about it. Okay, so if you are working with a non-Java library uh, for a different programming language, then you would find that it too will have a very similar set of settings. These, it's kind of like you know, IP address port number. Once you know what those concepts represent, it doesn't matter what programming language you're using, it'll always say, tell me the host name, tell me the IP address, tell me the port number. So high level, what's gonna happen is that uh, we'll have the human being who is the resource owner uh, who's going to use an application like let's say uh, web app uh, application one down here. He's gonna make requests to the application server. Client in the context of OAuth and OpenID Connect doesn't actually refer to your phone. It doesn't refer to uh, your, you know, the mobile app. It refers to the application side of, of it, the actual server side code. Uh, so if I have a mobile app, uh, the client would be the API that the mobile app talked to. All right. And what that's going to do is it's going to say, great, I want to access something uh, and I need to go and ask the authorization server and say, hey, authorization server, please ask the owner of the data located at resource server X, uh, do, you want, do you want to allow me to have access to it? The, resource, uh, the authorization server goes to the human being and says, do you want to allow application one to access resource server X? If the human says yes, then uh, the authorization server will be able to provide a token to the client, and then the client will be able to use that access token to call the server. And that's the, basically what it defines. There are variations of this, and I'm not gonna get into the details of those. What I'm gonna do instead is try to kind of summarize them into a very simple one sentence about each one so that they're easier to remember. Who's read the details of how this works in a blog post at some point? And who's later found out that blog post was out of date? And you're like, it made perfect sense when you were reading it. And like an hour later, you saw one of your programming friends and you tried to explain to them what you learned. And you're like a stuttering person. You're like, uh, yeah, it made sense five minutes ago. Um, so a good way to think about this is to say, all right, um, we have the client application, which is an app server that wants to call something. It needs to convince the authorization server to give it an access token. So it needs, the, so it needs to kind of go to the authorization server and say, hey, authorization server, you should give me an access token because I actually know the username and password of the end user. If you know the owner's username and password, well, I have their password, you should just give me a token because I have their password. This was designed and added to the specification to allow interoperability with, uh, with, with legacy applications that didn't fully understand things, and you don't want to, uh, you don't want to be storing it in clear text the user's password. You want, it's easier, to, it's better to store the access token rather than the password so you can replay it later, right? 
Um, so it's a codification of an anti pattern in the standard. Uh, Right, if you're using things like uh, the CFCLI, this will use it. If you have a first-party application, like uh, maybe the, you know, like it's the same people that built the server side, you might be willing to trust it with a username and password. But there are better solutions than this. Uh, the second one is called client credentials, which basically means you're telling the authorization server, you should give me a token because there is no user. I am acting on my, my own behalf. I am both the server and the user. Uh, so that's what that is. So in this case, there's no human being. So it's a simple username and password exchange. The third one is what's called the implicit grant. And here, you're basically saying to the authorization server, go ask the user if I can access their resources. However, by the way, I can't be trusted with any of the tokens you give me back. I might actually lose those tokens. Somebody might snoop on them because you're getting these tokens over ins an insecure channel. And, and therefore, don't give me any long-lived tokens. Don't, uh, uh, don't give me a refresh token. Right? There's no reason for you to be using this flow. Okay? So erase it out of your mind. Just covering it for completeness. Uh, the last flow is the one that you all probably are going to use. This is what's called the authorization code grant flow. This is what Joe demoed uh, earlier. So in this approach, what we do here is we say, go ask the user if I can access their resources, by the way, I can keep all my tokens secure. So I want you as the authorization server to give me two things. I want you to give me a, an access token, and I want you to give me a refresh token. Right, what's the difference between the two? Uh, the access token is something that I will use when I'm making calls to other microservices. I will pass the access token to them. But as soon as I pass the access token to somebody else, I don't know if that other person isn't going to lose it, right? They could accidentally do system outprint LN and save the access token to the logs. Uh, they could get hacked and have that access token stolen. So, uh, so we don't want that access token to be something that would live for a long time. We would want the access token to expire at some point. And, and when it expires, we need to get a new access token. So we have two ways to get that new access token. We can go back to the human being and ask them, but what happens if the human being is sleeping or is eating dinner or is not around? That's where the refresh token kicks in. The refresh token is only ever exchanged with the authorization server, all right? So I, uh, if I do the authorization code grant, I get two tokens, the access token that I send down to the APIs that I call, and the refresh token, which I use to get new access tokens after my current access token expires. And that is OAuth 2 in like five minutes. Comments, questions? So what's OpenID Connect? OpenID Connect says, great, we've got this group of standards called uh, uh, OAuth 2. Uh, we've got the, 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 the JOT and the Jose standards. We also have something called TLS. Let's combine all of those together in a particular use set of use cases, and we're going to call that OpenID Connect, and we're going to focus that on being able to tell information about the user that got, that got locked in. So it's, it's, the standard is built on top of those other standards. And it says that you have to have an identity token, which gives you some information about the user, which has to be a JOT. It also defines what's called a user info endpoint. This is an actual REST endpoint that you can call. You can give it some information, and it will come back with more info about the user. Things like where's your actual, uh, like a link to your photo, uh, uh, your phone number, your details. And so most OAuth 2 servers that you can get your hands on don't just implement OAuth 2, they also implement OpenID Connect. Um, and there are huge, large-scale implementations on the internet of this. Like if you go to Stack Overflow and then you log in with, with Google uh, for, to log into Stack Overflow, that's over OpenID Connect. Uh, so a whole bunch of the fields that used to be optional become absolutely mandatory. You have to actually you know, implement these, these fields, things like uh, ISS, IAT, expiry, subject, audience, and, and various other ones. Um, luckily for when you're working with something like Spring Security uh, 5, it takes care of all of these low-level details. So what we've done here is we've just opened up the hood a little bit to see what's underneath all of the magic that makes this work. And, uh, and that is 
the standards layer cake in a nutshell. Oh wow, we're ahead of schedule, so <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna keep going. Are there any questions about any of the the, the background standards that you need? Yeah. Is there a key rollover mechanism specified in the standards? Um, they kind of, the standards leave are talking for the most part around how different parts interact with each other. So if I have something like the UAA, I'm gonna have to own rotating the keys of the UAA. There isn't a, a, a thing that says, you know, you must rotate your stuff every two hours or every uh, 24 hours. So whatever product you use as the OpenID Connect server, you have to look at its documentation to see how to do all of those things. Great question, though. If I could just uh, add to that, um, as far as <clears throat> how uh, Spring Security handles that, yeah, th that's provider specific, right? The provider's got to implement the key rotation. Um, but as far as on the resource server side is, you know, if a rotation did happen, right, and then Axe token comes into a resource server, it checks, it, it correlates the kid parameter in the header. If it's not in the internal cache of that resource server, it'll fetch the the public keys on the on the JWK set URI again, right? And then try to validate. That's how it all works. So it wouldn't fail if a rotation happened. It would just refetch the JWK set URI. Yeah. So uh, just to to yeah to kind of make it a bit more uh, specific. Remember when I decoded this guy here? The metadata told me the key ID was key-id-1, and when I went to the token endpoint of the server, it told me that's key-id1. That's how it can figure it out. Right. Uh, question? Go ahead. In SAML, one of the toughest things is when you sync or sign out. Do you stand up to cover that? Uh, do, <laughs> uh, I think, like, not directly. There isn't, like, if you look in the OAuth 2 spec, there isn't, like, here's how you do it. So typically, uh, what you got to do is you have to kind of log out from the OpenID Connect server, but you might still have sessions that are active with the individual applications. Joe, something to add to that? Yeah, there, there's, there are a couple of standards. Yeah, we should probably re repeat the question. Um, the question was, are there standards to allow single sign out, single sign out, right? That's the question. So there are a couple of standards um, with, with OpenID Connect, um, back channel logout and front channel logout. We are gonna actually implement probably the back channel logout, I'm thinking, for maybe 5.2, but they are out there. We haven't really dived deep into it yet, but if you need it, please log an issue and, and people could upvote, right? Because that's how we kind of, um, bring in features into the next release. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? All righty. Um, since we have time, Joe, yes. stay up here. We're, we're just going to continue on. We're going to now look at um, what are the central uh, classes, what's, what's actually in Spring Security 5 for working with all of this infrastructure? Yeah, so um, I was making reference to this earlier, the client registration, right? The central classes, you know, the client registration, the OAuth to authorized client. These are really, these two are the central classes to OAuth to client functionality. What are they, right? Um, I got a just really simple diagram here for client registration. As I was talking about earlier, client registration, I mean, it's just, it's the metadata of the client registered at the provider. That's it, it's simple as that, right? So when I configure the application properties, I've configured my client ID, client secret, the authorization grant this client's gonna perform, the scopes it's gonna send to the token endpoint, or the, the authorization endpoint to authorize um, the user to access these particular protected resources based on these scopes and, and all that information, right? So it's the client metadata that's registered at the provider. That's the client rep registration representation within Spring Security OAuth 2 clients. The client registration repository, I mean, it's a repository that aggregates client registrations, right? Default implementation, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, in-memory client registration. You might, 
um, you know, implement your own client registration repository where you store client registration in a database or in a, another external store if that is your requirement. And all you would have to do really is client registration repository. It's got this one operation, find by registration ID. Again, that client registration ID, that unique identifier that's also used in a lot of different places, right? So it's just a really simple one interface operation on the client registration repository implementation, and then you just register it as a bean, right? That's, that's the client registration, client registration repository. Now, when you go through, when you trigger, so in the example area, open ID uh, authentication, we had the login client. That was the registration ID, right? And, and, we, and we saw the, the properties that were set, configured for that client registration. Now, when I went through that flow, the open ID connect authentication flow, the end result of that is an ID token and an access token, right? Ultimately, that client is authorized, right? The user authorized this client to access my protected resources, which is my user info information, email address, and so forth, right? So the end result of that is you've authorized this client, hence OAuth to authorize clients. Right? And all that really is, it's an association class. Right? It associates the, the different entities that, um, uh, that, that are related within the end result of an authorization code grant flow. OpenID Connect in this particular case for the login client. So we have the client registration ID, the resource owner principal, so that's myself. For example, I logged in, you know, my, my subject claim, my unique identifier at UAA is one, two, three, four, five, that's what that is, right? It's my unique identifier, you know, as the resource owner um, at the provider. <clears throat> and the end result of that flow is the access token, right? Also optionally a refresh token, I'm not showing that here, but the OAuth to authorized client does have another attribute refresh token. If the refresh token comes back on the token endpoint for authorization code and if it's configured on the client. All right, so that's, that's an optional attribute there. So the OAuth2 authorized client, this is what developers are gonna need access to when you're making a protected resource call because ultimately that's where the access token is and you need that to set the authorization bearer header, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the authorized client. And just like the client registration, or client registration, it's also got a repository, authorized client repository. Now, um, the default implementation here is HTTP session, right? So, you know, after the session expires, let's say your access token and refresh token is gone. You may want to also implement this and store your refresh token and, your, or, and or your access token in a store, right? So this is another, uh, another um, uh, extension point where you could implement an authorized client repository um, and then register it as a bean. Right, and it's as simple as that, and I'll just pick it up, and uh, and and it's it's I'll show I'll show you the interface there right now, actually, <clears throat> so you can see what what it entails to implement that. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do this here. Okay, there it is there. And uh, so we have, uh, I'm gonna just close this up so we have a better, so the interface, so we got load authorized client, takes the registration ID, the currently authenticated principal, and the request, right? So that's, that's, that's loading it. Um, and then we got save and remove. So pretty, pretty, pretty easy implementation, right? And you could easily look at the in-memory um, or the HTTP session-based one as a you know kind of template implementation, and inside you could complete you know complete your own JDBC or Redis or, or whatever that is, and you just register this as a B, right? So that's uh, that is so those are the two the two. Um, uh, you know, central classes, client registration and authorized clients, right? So now we've, we've basically kind of wrapped up um, the client side and we're gonna start jumping to the resource server side and now we're gonna like have a series of demos. But before, you know, I get to that and showing the code on that end of things, I'm gonna hand it over to Deeb here.
But are there any questions as far as what I just talked about right now? Anybody? You guys good? Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe we want to do the break now because then we, we Actually, can, that's a good idea. Yeah, we, that's a good, that's the, a good yeah. stop now to do the break. We're going to come back and what we're going to look through are uh, just be, so you guys want to come back. We're going to look at what it would take to call microservice. A uh, client calls microservice A. A turns around and calls B. B turns around and calls C. What are all the different variations that can happen there? How are all, what are all the different ways of doing that? Okay. Yeah. So I'll see you guys in half an hour. Uh, welcome back. Uh, thanks for, uh, I hope you guys had a, a good break and you've enjoyed the first uh, half of this uh, uh, deep dive. Um, so we spent the first uh, part of the presentation talking about um, uh, Spring Security 5, OpenID Connect, how to actually do a login. And now we want to fix, uh, focus the rest of the presentation on some of the security problems around securing microservices. So we're gonna, we break that, we've broken that up into two sections. Part one focuses on how to secure a single microservice. Imagine that, your whole entire world is one microservice, and that's not very realistic. So part two of the second part is gonna be what about when I have multiple microservices? And the sample application that uh, you saw earlier has all these scenarios in it, so Joe will go into the exact details of how it's implemented. So the first question is, uh, how is a single microservice secured? And our problem is that microservices, like, you know, they talk to each other. And uh, if you're the triangle microservice, how do you find out who's calling you and what they are allowed to do? So the essence of the solution is we kind of want everybody to kind of say, stop, please have ID ready. Okay, we want to be able to tell us the green, uh, the triangle microservice, who's calling us and what they're allowed to do, which raises two questions. Question number one is, what is the communication protocol that is used from the, between microservices? And question number two is, what is the format of the token that represents the papers of a microservice? So let's focus first on what protocol does a microservice speak? So most of you here, if I say, who, when they think microservice, who thinks HTTP, raise your hand. Everybody, okay, who thinks maybe it's my microservice is just actually getting messages over AMQP or JMS. Perfectly legitimate. No, nothing says a microservice has to only do HTTP. Or maybe you use uh, Apache Thrift, or maybe you use gRPC, or maybe you use some custom TCP protocol. The key idea here that we're trying to get at is there is no best protocol for microservices. You know, there's just what we currently use, and there's going to be what we will use in the future as protocols and uh, technology evolves. So whatever security solution we use for representing the identity papers that, that tell us who's calling us, we would like that solution to be generic enough to work with multiple protocols. So, yeah, that's the... Micro, this is the place where, okay, I don't know where, that slide is in the wrong spot. <laughs> Copy and paste error. Uh, so we're gonna go to what format should the security token use? So the security token is, uh, we can ask questions about it. Is the token format standardized? Uh, can the token be used with any protocol? Um, is the token easy to parse? Can we look inside this token and see what's in there? Can the token be included in a URL parameter? Can we throw it into an HTTP header? Can we throw it into a protocol other than HTTP? Are there lots of libraries and lots of programming languages for working with the token? Or are we stuck with you know, two programming languages that have good implementation, everybody else there, you're out on your own? Uh, is the token format considered easy to work with? So if we keep, keep this list of questions in the back of your mind and let's ask, what are the uh, security standards for token formats? So if you're looking at uh, the 90s, well, we got Kerberos tickets. You know, that's Active Directory, uh, that's Windows NT, that's a lot of, uh, you know, the original kind of SSO server to a certain extent. And uh, it's a binary formatted uh, ticket, uh, and, and so it's not exactly ideal for what we want to do. Uh, you can't take a Kerberos ticket and like kind of stick it into an HTTP query parameter or into a, a header. If you like XML, you can use uh, SAML, and that's from the 2000s. 
And the, the thing about SAML is it's kind of heavily tied to the SAML protocol. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have shivers when they try to work with it. So, <laughs> so let's skip that one. And uh, let's focus on JWT tokens. Uh, so JWT tokens are what we talked about earlier. They are uh, based on JSON. They've been kind of standardized since 2015, so they're a few years old. And the interesting thing about them is they're not tied to a particular protocol. Like we saw examples of how to use JWS and JWT beyond just OpenID Connect and uh, an OAuth 2. Uh, so they're kind of generic. So we kind of like them. So the basic picture that we're looking at is, say we have our microservice A, it's going to call microservice B. Uh, we'd like every request to include a security token that microservice B can easily do a few things with. with. One is uh, we can easily authenticate who's calling us. We know who's calling us. We know that the token wasn't tampered with. We can tell that the token isn't expired and all that type of stuff. And once we know who's calling us, we can use that to make authorization decisions. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, we're just going to say, let's use JWT for that. Now, it isn't the, the you can use non-JWT tokens for this, and we will actually cover that later on today. Um, Joe will talk about how that can be, how can that be handled. Uh, but assume that we have a token, we can quickly tell if it's been tampered with or not, we can read what's in it. What we don't expect in the token is every possible permission that you have. So your token might say things like you're allowed to uh, uh, do, uh, do op operation A. There might be other th authorization decisions that are a combination of the information in the token plus business logic rules that you have plus data that you've loaded from your own database to express the full-blown uh, complex business logic, which might be like, yeah, I'm transferring money, but if the amount is uh, below, um, you know, uh, 100,000 euros, anybody can do it. If it's over 100,000 euros, you need like two approvals or three approvals or whatever it happens to be. Um, so that's basically the, the picture and what we, I'm going to turn it over to Joe now to talk about how do we actually implement microservice B in Spring Security 5. Uh, so that we can uh, uh, we can have a resource server, and then how do we implement the calls out and make sure that we're passing uh, the correct authorization headers in? Okay, thanks, Adib. <clears throat> yeah, so 5.1 we introduced resource server support um, with JWT um, support. Um, that's the only access token format supported currently. Um, I'm going to get to opaque token support shortly, but the first thing that I want to demonstrate is the sample. Um, let's let's take a look at the sample and how we structured things. And this, you could consider this sample as an educational sample because ultimately, what we've done here. Oh, that's uh, the wrong user. What we the way we structured this sample is. Um, Instead of, instead of creating a, a domain model where you kind of just get lost with the domain model, whether it's a purchase order app or whatever, we've kept this very, very generic. Because really, all we're trying to demonstrate with this sample is the Spring Security specific implementations for a client and resource server. You just want to look at that code. That's it. And the flows, the best practices on different flows. When microservice A calls a downstream microservice, you know, how do you call it? What, what, what grant does that client go through uh, to, to get an access token to be able to call that service? Which grant is suitable for these different flows? So we have these, we have these five flows here that we're going to basically demonstrate um, over the next half hour or so, or next hour. Um, and uh, but the first, I'm going to start off with the most simple flow, right? We have a UI app, right? You know, leveraging the API gateway pattern. And when I say API gateway pattern, I don't actually mean an API gateway. It's a well-known pattern. It's where all requests from the client go through this UI app, we're calling it. But it's it's that pattern. All the requests go through here, and this UI app either calls another microservice, fans out to multiple microservices, and those microservices might call other microservices downstream and so forth, right? So we have the UI app calling service A, right? That's the first you know, pattern, the, the, the simplest one, right? So let's demonstrate this. I'm just gonna give you a, I'm gonna get rid of that breakpoint. <clears throat> 
and I'm going to give you a, a little, you know, high level of what, and when I say educational, we're displaying information here, right? What's happening with the downstream calls, because it's, it's a lot harder to be able to debug at resource servers, look at the JWT, decode it, look at the claims and all that stuff. So we're, we did our best to be able to display all this information in the UI so you could just see it, right? Um, so this one here, as you can see at the very top, we just got the flow sequence. Um, you know how, um, you know what, what exactly is happening, and then we have you know a table per flow, right? So this one's very simple, right? So we have the UI app gives you the URI call service A gives you the URI there. The key the key attributes or claims here to pay attention to as we as we progress through is the the identifier of the access token. So when UI app called service A it passed an access token or a JWT access token with a unique identifier of this, this number here. That access token has this, um, uh, the scopes attached authority A. You'll see this, I'm gonna talk about this, you'll see this well-known prefix scope underscore. So that access token, the way Spring Security um, has implemented authorities within the authentication, it extracts scopes and prefixes it with this scope underscore. I'm gonna get more into that in a little bit. Just, just wanted to make a note of that and why, why is there a scope uppercase underscore there? That, there there's a reason to that. Um, and then obviously the subject, right? I authenticated, that's my unique identifier, user one with UAA. That's, you know, the subject claim within that token. And obviously the audience. So client A is the one that was authorized here um, during the authorization code flow. That actually happened previously. Um, we got the consent screen. Do you authorize client A to access, uh, to, to access protected resource authority A. So we're just keeping the names very generic. So we got microservice A, client A, client A has authority A and so forth. So that's kind of the naming conventions. And you know, we just got some extra information here, the ID token claims, the client registrations on the UI app and so forth. Um, we're not gonna focus too much on that. We, we really wanna just focus on UI app calling service A, those attributes, right? So, so th that's how we've structured the, the app, the sample app, and we're gonna see some more complicated flows as we progress, right? We'll keep it simple. So now, how did we implement service A? How do we implement microservice A, this microservice, this resource server, right? Let's take a look at that. Well, the first thing is we're gonna go to the microservice A here. The first thing is we're gonna take a look at the dependencies. So the dependencies for resource server is is basically the the Spring Security OAuth two resource server. There's actually a starter for this um, that actually I should have probably updated, but there is a starter Spring Boot starter um, for OAuth two resource server. Um, but it ultimately imports Spring Security OAuth two resource server. And we also got to additionally import Spring Security OAuth to Jose, right? Like I said, this initial version of resource server, it supports JWT access tokens, right? So the OAuth to Jose supports that, the JWT decoder and so forth. So those are the two dependencies for resource server. And then as far as the, the configuration goes, is so we have this you know, same property path as client, Spring Security OAuth 2, and we had client, but for resource server, it's resource server, right? And then we have JWT and then the JWK set URI. So we got to configure that um, so the resource server could ultimately fetch the public keys from the well known JSON, uh, uh, JWK set endpoint of the provider. And, uh, and so that's, that's the only configuration that we need to, we need to provide for a resource server. Now, if we look at if we look at the the security configuration for resource server is so OAuth to resource server properties. That's a Spring Boot um, specific class where it just re read all the properties that we've configured there. Um, we could look at the DSL here, HTTP OAuth to resource server, just like. OAuth to login, we also have OAuth to client, 
and for resource service, OAuth to resource server. So this is where we would configure the JWK set URI. Now I'm overriding this, the, the security configuration here, but that property that I, uh, that I configured in the properties file, Spring Boot would automatically configure that for us. But I'm doing some customizations here, so Spring Boot's auto configuration backs off because I've provided my own security configuration. But I'm still leveraging Spring Boot's OAuth to resource server properties because it, it read it for me, so I'm just gonna use that to set the JWK set URI over here. But the main thing I wanted to show you here is you know, just, just as we're familiar with, uh, you know, uh, setting up our authorization rules with whether it's form login or whatever authentication mechanism we used before, it looks exactly the same for, for OAuth 2, right, for resource server functionality. You know, ultimately we have, um, we have an authentication, right? And uh, I'm going to open that up. Uh, where is it? Authentication. And we're just going to kind of review this a little bit. So the authentication interface, right? Um, this is basically, I mean, when we logged in with OpenID Connect, it was the OAuth 2 authentication token, right? That's what happened on the UI app side of things. On the resource server side of things, when that JWT comes in or when that access token comes in, um, the resource server or the filter or the authentication provider will ultimately resolve this to a JWT authentication token if it's a JWT that's coming in. That's the authentication in instance. Um, and then we have these authorities, right? This is what we use to, to uh, you know, set up our authorization rules, right? You know, has role, has authority, and so forth. By default, the JWT authentication converter, right, that's what's ultimately used. When that JWT comes in and the authentication provider validates the signature based on the JWK, that it correlates. And the way it correlates is there's a, there's a kid parameter in the JWS header, right, kid as in key identifier, and it's the, I, the key identifier that you, that you saw on the JWK set URI, that JSON object, there's a kid parameter there, one, two, three, four, five, right? When the provider issues an access token, it assigns a kid parameter in the JWS header, one, two, three, four, five. So when that comes into the resource server, the, the JWT authentication provider ultimately reads this, or the JWT decoder reads the header, the kid correlates it with the internally cached JWK set, and then it uses that public key to verify the signature, right? Signature gets verified, and ultimately what, gets, what comes back from that JWT authentication provider is a JWT authentication token, right? So that's the, that's the authentication instance on the resource server side compared to the client side, we got the OA2 authentication token, right? So we got the JWT authentication token, right? On, on the resource server side. So if we look at, if we look at that, that class, and we'll look at it here, and we have the, the JWT object here, right? The attribute, right? Let me just see here, there we go. Now the JWT authentication token, as you can see, it's got an attribute in the super there. Um, it's, you know, uh, yeah, it's actually right over here. Yep, and then it, it basically, so the JWT is an abstract authentication token. Um, this is ultimately what's, uh, what's uh, you know, returned by the, the authentication provider. So this JWT, um, it gets resolved, it get, the signature gets validated, and in the JWT, we have authorities as well. The JWT authentication converter, it will extract the scopes, right, from the JWT, whether it's SCP or scope, right, supports both of those attributes, and every provider, you know, uh, has a different way of storing the scope attribute, and, and the JWT authentication converter is that, 
that extension point to be able to resolve the scopes or other authorities that may be in the JWT, right? But by default, the JWT authentication converter will resolve the scope attributes and add that to the list of authorities within the authentication, right? And we got back here, the authentication get authority. So it will resolve that. And that's where the JWT authentication token will prefix that authority with scope, right? Just so it doesn't collide with potentially other authorities. So we prefix it with scope underscore, and then whatever that scope parameter is. For client A in our samples, it's authority A. For client A, B, it's authority A, authority B, right? That's, that's kind of how we follow the, 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 the naming patterns within clients and scopes and so forth. So back to the resource server config. Now, when I, when I go back to this sample here, just so you could you know, follow it as we progress, as you can see here, UI app calls service A and it's client A, right? And it's scope authority A, right? So ultimately in that, um, in that access token that service A receives, there's a, there's an access, there's a, there's a scope parameter authority A. So that's our, you know, authority like information. So obviously we're going to use authority like information in our authorization rules of our web security configure adapter authorize requests as we have here, right? So we here have MVC matchers, service A is, that's my controller there, um, has authority scope underscore A. So very familiar, right? Very familiar as far as, um, you know, how to set up your authorization rules for OAuth resource server. Are there any questions before I kind of move on to the next? Yes. Say, say that again. Uh, without any configuration. Yes. Well, with yeah, without any configuration, by default, you got to be authenticated, right? That's that is like if you didn't supply your web security configure adapter and your author. Actually, I should repeat that question so everybody heard. With, without any configuration, without any custom web security configure adapter, will it protect all the endpoints, right? That was the question. Yeah, by default, you gotta be authenticated, right? So when that JWT, that authentication provider resolves that JWT, it does create a JWT authentication token that is authenticated, so it would work, right? But obviously, um, you know, so, so, so it would still go to that service A controller and, and, and it would still work, right? But this is, if you want finer grained authorization, then this is what you would do, right? Your custom, your custom rules. Okay. Any other questions before I move on there? Yes. Sorry, can you speak a little louder? I can't hear you. It's a bit, bit louder. Well, as as far as H using HTTPS, that's that's like that's all configured within the environment, right? That's that has that's that's above that's below the application layer. So, however you configure the the the, the configuration between the client and resource server, that's that's all environment related. Does that make sense? However, when you're making when you're making a you know, so I'm going to show you this demo with with Spring Secure with uh, Spring Framework 5's, uh, you know, web client, yeah, like if you're doing, for example, mutual SSL, then yes, then you would have to do some configuration um, with, with the web client. But if you're just doing, you know, standard HTTPS, one-way SSL, that's all lower, that's all environment configuration, so it doesn't change this, 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 uh, c this application setup. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. So let's let's dig down to um, let's dig down to the controller here. So now that we've we've configured this, now that's literally all you got to do for resource server. So your class path, right? Your properties, JWK set URI, and your custom resource server config. But that's optional once again, 
you know, if, if, if you want to protect your endpoints just by, you know, being authenticated, then that's it. But if you want finer grain authorization, then you provide your custom security configure adapter. That's literally it. That is how you would enable a resource server done, right? Um, but there's a lot more customizations that you can do, but that's the most simplest setup. Now, what if I wanted access to the JWT authentication token in one of the controllers, right? Because I want access to the JWT, because I want to access some of the claims in there and do something with it, right? Pretty simple. As you can see here, service A, just like, just like you know, everything previously, an authentication object gets resolved automatically in a controller handler. So all I got to do is I, I know it's the JWT authentication token. That's the authentication instance. I just supply this right here you know, as a method parameter, JWT authentication, and now I have full access, right, to the actual JWT, right? So I could literally um, grab access to the JWT. I got the headers, I got the claims, and I got it, I got every, all access. And there's, there's some, there's some, uh, you know, convenience helper methods, get issue, get subject, get audience, and so forth, right? So you could use this doing some customizations with JWT claims validation. I'm going to get to that in a bit because after, and this is very common, um, I mean, this is pretty much standard across the board where you're going to want to validate at least the issuer claim. Okay, fine, the JWT comes in, it's good, the signature is good, and, and now you want to do some extra validation. What, like, for example, validate the issuer claim. Maybe you want to validate the audience, right? This is, these are common use cases. The plug-in point for that is the JWT claims validator. And I'm going to get to that in a bit um, when we kind of delve down into more of the samples. But you could do extra validation there. Uh, yeah. So, but the, the main thing I wanted to point out is is uh, if you want access to the JWT, you could literally just in your controller method, um, you know, set up, you know, the JWT authentication and you have access to the JWT. Just like I was showing with the authentication principle, if I want access to the OIDC user, you know, you got to use the annotation for that one to resolve the authentication.get principle. But in the case for a JWT authentication token, you just specify that type in your controller handler. Okay. Um, I think those are the main things that I wanted to show as far as resource setting up a resource server and the most basic setup we're going to we're going to get more advanced into the customizations like validating claims doing custom authority mapping of the GWT authentication token and so forth i'm going to hand it over to deep for the next set of slides all okay. right thanks joe so who was uh, pleasantly surprised that it was easier than you expected to write a resource server? It's not that really that hard, right? So I, I hope you're starting to see login we can do easily, writing authorization server, uh, resource servers we can do easily. Um, so, oh, opaque tokens. Are we going to talk about that? Oh, yes, yes. We forgot about that. So yeah. what happens if you're not getting a... And Joe, what happens if we if if we get called, but it's not a a jot that we can decode? Well, we don't we don't support that yet. Um, that is planned for five point two, opaque token support, uh, which. So that's an implementation of, the introspection endpoint. There's an RFC out there for that, and ultimately, it's an opaque token, right? It's unreadable. Um, resource server cannot deduce that to anything. Nobody can really, only the authorization server can. So what happens in this case, and, and this really is, you know, a critical feature. This is definitely going to get in 5.2. We were trying to squeeze it into 5.1, but, you know, we, we can't rush things, right? So uh, JWT seems to be the most popular. We, that's, we decide, okay, we'll go with JWT first. But opaque token support is definitely coming in 5.2. And what happens here is, you know, when the when the client goes through the flow and it gets an access token and it's an opaque token, it sends it to the resource server, and then the resource server ultimately calls the authorization server's introspection endpoints, 
passes that opaque token and what comes back is kind of similar to what a JWT has, a JWT, JWT claim set, right? So the claims in the JWT body, what comes back is from the introspection endpoint is those claims, right? And then ultimately in, in those claims, you have scopes and authorities and so forth, subject and all the things that you would see in a JWT. So that's definitely coming in 5.2. Right now it's not supported, but the big advantage and I'll talk about the biggest advantage of opaque tokens is you could revoke uh, an opaque token. So for example, um, Axe token got leaked, right? Opaque token comes into the resource server, calls the introspection endpoint authorization server, no, this, this, this has been revoked, right? Nothing comes back, right? And then a uh, resource server fails, the request doesn't go through. So huge advantage. Now JWTs on the other hand is same scenario. Um, Axe token got leaked, but the expiry on that JWT is like an hour from now, right? JWT just validates expire. Well, it's still good for another hour. Let's it proceed, right? So there's a, there's definitely there's ways around it, but it gets complicated, right? The bottom line is to be able to revoke revoke an opaque token is pretty easy. A JWT a lot more difficult. It's doable, but it's a lot more difficult. It involves a lot of complexities. I've seen like these patterns where opaque token is what's on the public side. JWTs or self-contained tokens are on the private network side. So the opaque token comes in to an API gateway or, or something similar to an API gateway. It has a mapping of the opaque token to the JWT, finds the mapping and then the gateway passes down the JWT to downstream services within the network, right? To avoid that latency call, because ultimately, if a resource server had to call the introspection endpoint on each request, I mean, things are not gonna scale, right? So, so that's why that pattern is, is a pretty, pretty important pattern. I, I've seen that being used where opaque token on the public side, on, so you could so you could revoke it, and then on the inside you got the JWT to avoid that late extra latency call. Thanks, okay. Joe. All right. Um, so uh, we covered the case where you have only one microservice, and we all wish we only had one, right? <laughs> and it was small; it wasn't really a monolith. But what ha what happens when we have multiple microservices? So. Uh, imagine a scenario like this. I have uh, a web application and I have some data on my screen that comes from microservice A. I have some stuff that comes from microservice B and some stuff that comes from microservice C. Should I make three separate network calls from the browser to each one of those microservices? Um, what about my mobile client? You know, people are walking around into the subway, out of the subway, have bad network connectivity. Do I want to start three separate connections or one, one connection? Uh, what if I want to do server-side rendering of what this stuff looks like so uh, so that, you know, the search engines find it and all that kind of cool stuff? So I know what you guys are thinking. Uh, we're going to introduce a third a fourth microservice. We're going to call this one uh, the, the, the Edge Gateway microservice. And this way, our browser is going to make calls to this uh, uh, UI microservice, and so will our native mobile client. Uh, this is a pretty reasonable pattern. I'm sure many of you have already implemented this. Uh, there are a couple of challenges with this pattern. Uh, challenge number one is that, um, you know, it turns out that maybe in the native uh, up, uh, mobile application, we need a little bit less data than we would in the browser. So pretty soon people start adding little like uh, query options to the UI edge microservice that's like, give me this subset of the data. Uh, because I don't want to pay the cost of transferring over the wire. And uh, pretty soon you might have a full-blown programming language on your hands for your little expressions that you're asking for subsets of data. I've actually seen that happen. Uh, it's, it's terrible. Never do that. Um, and then there's uh, the, the other problem with it is regression testing. So when I add a field that I require on the browser, which I might not care about on the mobile app, I have to regression test the mobile app. When I do something that's unique for the mobile app, I have to regression test the browser. And I know that we all love regression testing, right? Not. Um, so what is the alternative around that? There's a kind of a well-known pattern called the back end for front end. Uh, and in this situation, what we're going to do is we're going to say that uh, the iPhone mobile application is going to have an iPhone BFF, 
which is an, an, an endpoint that is dedicated to the iPhone app. And we'll have one for the browser and we'll have another one for the Android app. And the concept here is to think of the BFF not as a published API, but more as user interface code that we've extracted out of the client and onto the server side. So if I have a screen in my iPhone application and I want uh, six fields in it, then I make one call to the iPhone BFF and I get the six things that I need. Uh, similarly, in the on the browser side, uh, I would just make calls and get just what I need. So naturally, the BFF should be written by the people who write the actual UI. So the iPhone mobile developer should be writing the BFF for iPhone. The uh, browser developer should be writing the, the, uh, the, the BFF for the web application, uh, for the uh, UI, web UI, okay? Any questions about this pattern, the BFF? Anybody here implemented BFF at all? Raise your hand if you have. I see a few hands, okay. So if you take a step back, this is kind of what the big picture ends up looking like. You end up having uh, you know, a GUI layer where you have something that humans kind of go and like touch and, and do things with. And then we're gonna have the edge microservice slash BFF. And then that one is gonna co coordinate a series of internal uh, microservices that we have to basically figure out how to secure. All right, so uh, to the opaque token conversation, uh, you may want to have between the, you know, just in front of your edge microservices, some traditional API gateways that, that will give back to the GUI layer a whole bunch of opaque tokens. Uh, and those would be like, you know, you know, J session ID would be like the simplest way to do this with a web application, right? You have your J session ID that you send back to your to your uh, single page Angular app, and then every AJAX request that comes in has that J session ID cookie in it. Um, and uh, this way, it's it's relatively easy for you to you know do validation and not bother all of the internal microservices with requests that are going to fail anyway because something wasn't supposed to get through the front door. Um, now, if we take these internal microservices, say, let's take a step back. Let's say we had a monolithic version of this application. How would we secure it? We would have in the HTTP session, just like a div is logged in, and then somewhere in there, there's going to be an if statement, say, does a div have permission to do some operation? Uh, when we take the monolith and we decompose it into microservices, we have to worry about people using curl to just kind of do things to our microservices. So we want to block them from doing that. We need to secure the call chain. And so there's a, a bunch of patterns that we can do this. So imagine this scenario here. We have application one, which is going to call the BFF. The BFF is going to make sure that it's going to have a token, an access token that it got. Then the BFF turns around, calls microservice A, passing down the blue token that it got. Microservice A is then going to pass that token to microservice B. This is what's called bearer token relay, whereby we just take the token, we pass it down the line. There are problems with this approach. Uh, a problem is that my token needs to have all the scopes in it. So the token would have to have the scopes for the BFF, for A, and for B. So my tokens can get pretty large, and the more stuff you put in the token, like scopes, the more dangerous your token is, because if somebody gets it, they can do a lot with it. Can you imagine? I need to call the money transfer microservice, and I need to call the locate me the nearest ATM microservice. Boom, get a token that has those two scopes in it. Maybe not a good idea. So what we're showing you here is what is possible. We're not saying you should run out and implement this without thinking about it and working with your information security team. So can I say that again? Please work with your InfoSec team to look at the specifics of the situation you're in to decide if this is OK or not. Um, Having said that, uh, you know, there was the recent kind of uh, hack of Facebook where they lost 50 million accounts and uh, just reading a typical, you know, kind of news articles where it clearly says the uh, perpetrator's ultimate aim was to steal what are known as OAuth bearer tokens. Essentially, these tokens prove the Facebook user is the rightful owner of an account and denote what they have access to. OAuth tokens are like car keys. If you're holding them, you can use them. There's no discrimination of the holder. So you gotta find a way to protect those JOT tokens. 
So that means you probably want to make sure at the very least you're doing mutual TLS between all the microservices. Bare minimum, mutual TLS between all the microservices, okay? And work with your InfoSec team to, to, to judge the risks that are involved in, in using bearer tokens. There are standards that are emerging for how to make bearer tokens safer to use. Uh, last time I checked, which was about three weeks ago, uh, the RFCs were getting pretty close to being an official standard. So different products and, and technologies have uh, at different stages. The big one here is something called token binding, whereby you want to uh, say that this particular bearer token will only work with this specific TLS SSL connection. So if somebody tries to steal that token and use it with a different SSL connection, uh, the SSL libraries will just say, no, you can't do that. You don't even have to do anything in your application code. Just the, 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 the lib SSL layer should just block that from happening. Okay, so having given you all these warnings, are there any questions before I turn it over to Joe to show you how to implement this token relay in, in Spring Security? All right, Joe. Thank you, Adib. So uh, let's, uh, let's jump to the actual demo. And let's take a look at this flow now, and then we'll, we'll dig into we'll dig into the code and how that's implemented. So the third flow right there. So we got UI app calling service A, and it also calls service B, and then service B calls service C using token relay, relaying that token to service C. Looks like I got logged out here. Okay. So I was logged out there, right? Um, I logged in, and now I'm using client ABC. I'm going to show you that 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 uh, client registration and configuration. I'm using client ABC for this token relay flow, right? And as you can see here, um, do you authorize client ABC to access my protected resource that are scoped authority A, authority B, authority C? That's that's what's going to be in the access token as far as scopes go. So I'm going to say, yeah, let's authorize. Okay, now it comes back, and let's take a look at the let's take a look at the flow. So UI app calls service A. As you can see, the JTI here is 24C. It's the same one across the board, right? UI app to service A to service B, and then service B calling downstream service C uses the same token. It's relaying the token, right? As you can see, it's the same access token, three scopes right, authorities, um, it's the same token. Now, how is this implemented? And, and before I even, you know, get to that is you got to be really, really careful with, with uh, and I've definitely seen this pattern and, you know, and it's, yeah, it's easy to be able to like just create one client that has four, five, six, seven scopes. Right? instead of setting up different clients for different specific flows. Yeah, it's a lot easier to do that, but that is super risky. Because in the end, a bearer token, if that gets leaked and it's got multiple scopes, ultimately multiple authorities associated with it, now the, now the attacker, the malicious user, could access multiple services if they could get through the front door, that is, right? But if they could get through the front door, then it could access six services or whatever that is. So you got to be very careful with that. Now, once again, I'm going to repeat that too. Talk to your InfoSec team about it. Does it make sense to have two or three scopes with an access token? Maybe it does if it's inside the, you know, inside uh, the private network. Maybe it does, right? But ultimately, that's kind of like a solution architecture decision. You got to consult with the InfoSec team and so forth. We're going to show you some patterns, you know, in the following demos to be able to narrow those scopes. So instead of those three scopes, we, we just want one scope with, with one new access token to call service C. Because service C only cares about authority C. It doesn't care about authority A and, and authority B. So we're gonna we're gonna show that. But let's look at the let's look at the implementation of token relay if you choose to you know, implement this for your specific use case. The first thing I wanted to show is the client registration configuration. Let's go into so it's the UI app, and I got this client ABC here, right? 
Now this is pretty familiar um, with the login client. So this was introduced in, in 5.1, just standard OAuth2 authorization code grant. This was introduced in 5.1. It's pretty much the same, the client registration. The, the big difference here really is the scope, right? For OpenID authentication, OpenID is the required scope to trigger OpenID authentication. As you can see here, you know we just got authority A, authority B, authority C in the scopes. So this will ultimately trigger the authorization code flow, the standard OAuth2 authorization code flow. Everything else is the same, right? My redire redirect URI is different. Um, with OAuth2 login, the default pattern is OAuth2 slash code or authorization slash code. For standard OAuth2, your re redirect URI could be whatever you want it to be. In this particular case, it's, it's basically the URI for my Flow ABC controller. I'm going to show you that. That's the only difference. So I just register that one client registration, and, and the differences are the redirect URI and the specific scopes. So that's the configuration for the UI end of things. Now, before, before I call the resource server, I mean, I need an HTTP client to be able to make that protected resource call. How does that work? So also with 5.1, we introduced um, web client extensions for OAuth2. So we're using web client instead of REST template. And uh, I'm going to show you that. How, how do we configure um, web client to use OAuth2, the OAuth2 authorized client repository, to ultimately set the authorization header make that protected resource call. Let's take a look at that setup. So we'll go to, I have this web client configuration. Now let's look at this, this is a super long name. Servlet OAuth2 authorized client exchange filter function, right? So web client has this interface, this plug in point where you could, it's called the exchange filter function, where you could pre-process the request or post-handle the response. It's your plug-in point, and that's what we're leveraging, right? Because we ultimately, what we need to do is we need to get the access token and put it in the authorization header before it makes that call, right? That's what we gotta do. This specific servlet OAuth to authorized client exchange filter function does exactly that, right? We need to just apply it with the authorized client, circling back to when I was talking about client registration, authorized client, the authorized client has the access token. So ultimately, and I'm gonna show you that code coming up next, this is just the configuration. All we need to do is create an instance of this exchange filter function, pass in the client registration repository, the authorized client repository, these registered beans in the context, pass them into it, and then with the web client builder, we just apply OAuth2, OAuth2 configuration. That's all, that's all we gotta do. This is pretty much um, a bean that you would just create in your OAuth client application and you're done, right? Now what this does is it not only sets the authorization header, if there's a refresh token on the OAuth2 authorized client and the access token expires, then it will perform the refresh grant and exchange the access token using the refresh token. It also does for client credentials, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but you could also supply a client ID instead of an authorized client, and it supports the client credentials grant. So if the access token or the client hasn't been authorized, it will call a token endpoint using the client credentials grant, and then ultimately resolve an authorized client, put that into the repository, the authorized client repository, and then make, set the bearer header and proceed with the request. But that's literally what you need to do to configure the web client OAuth2 extensions. Literally, that's it, nothing else. Now, um, how do I use the web client to make a protected resource call? Let's take, a look at, let's take a look at one of the controllers here, specifically the token relay one. So we'll look at Flow ABC token relay controller. Now, this was also added in 5.1, this annotation registered OAuth2 authorized client. It accepts a client registration ID. For this one, it's client ABC, right? As we saw in the application properties. It resolves an OAuth2 authorized client. So this is, this is a pretty handy annotation. Like literally, this triggers 
the authorization code grant flow if the client's not authorized. So when you saw, I tried to access, when I click on that link, it tries to access this endpoint, flow ABC, right? But the authorized client doesn't exist in the authorized client repository, then it triggers the authorization code flow. So then you saw I got redirected back to UAA and it says, do you authorize this client with these authorities, right? Trigger that flow. I click on authorize, um, the client makes a call to the token endpoint, gets the access token, puts it in the authorized client repository, and then redirects back to flow ABC, right? Redirects back here. Now it resolves it because we just went through the, the grant flow. Now it resolves it. Now I have the authorized client. It proceeds through the controller, right? So it's pretty handy. And this also works for client credentials. Same thing. If, if client C, which I'm going to demonstrate coming up, client C's client credentials, it will automatically just call a token endpoint, get the access token, put it in the authorized client repository, and then resolve that argument. And then the body of the controller method proceeds. So... That's the first thing you got to do because you ultimately need the authorized client because it has the access token. That's the most convenient way. You could also auto wire the authorized client repository, call the load authorized client passing in the parameters to get access to the authorized client. But there's, there's more setup involved there. This is the most convenient way using this specific annotation to resolve the authorized client that you need to use for a specific protected resource call. In this case, I, gotta, I wanna use client ABC, so I'm gonna specify the client registration in that annotation, and it will just do it for me. Now, how does that, now that I have the authorized client, how do I use that with the web client OAuth2 extension integration there. Let's take a look at that. Now this code here, I mean, the only thing we need to, I'm passing the authorized client into this method. The only thing we're really concerned about looking right now is this specific code here. One thing I wanted to point out too is the web client configuration or that bean, I created a servlet OAuth to authorize client exchange filter function, right? Because this is a servlet application, um, so I got to create that specific instance when I'm configuring the web client. For a reactive application, we have pretty much the same name, except instead of servlet, it's server, right? So you just need to, we, we got samples in this repo, you just got to create an instance of that. The same configuration applies, it's just a different instance of the exchange filter function for a non-blocking web client reactive application. You want to use that one. But uh, this one's a servlet one, so that's why I'm using that one. So everything else looks the same here. I mean, there's only one difference here is that attributes. As you can see, I'm importing the static method, which is coming from that exchange filter function that we, we instantiated there, and I'm setting the authorized client. What this is ultimately doing, it's setting you could call it a request scope attribute for this particular web client request. It sets the authorized client that I wanna use for this current request. That's what's happening here. And that exchange filter function, so that's all we gotta do on the client side to set up um, a specific client, a specific authorized client to make this protected resource call. And that exchange filter function will ultimately read the access token from that authorized client that's set in the request attributes, set the access token in the authorization header, and that's it. That's it. That's literally all you got to do on the, web, on the client side to make a protected resource call. Create that web client configuration being with that exchange filter function, and then resolve the authorized client that you want to use for a specific protected resource call using that annotation, the registered authorized client annotation, after you resolved it, and then you set it in the request scope of attributes. Those three steps, that's what you got to do for it to make a protected resource call. Before I get to the resource server side, are there any questions on that? Yes. Yes, uh, the question is, would that work for a post request? This is web client, so yeah, whatever web client supports. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Let's jump to, so client's making a protected resource call. 
Now the resource server is going to receive it. How, do, how, do, how does that look on the token relay and the things? Let's take a look at that. So <clears throat> back to our back to our app, we have UI app calling service A, UI, UI app calling service B, and then the token relay happens here, right? Service B calls service C, right? So we're going to jump to the sample to microservice B. And we're going to take a look at the implementation there. How does how is this token relay implemented? <clears throat> so here we have service B token relay controller. Everything applies what I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, we, we call service B that controller. We resolve the JWT authentication, and ultimately, and now now that we have that authentication, we could get access to the JWT and ultimately the JWT raw token, right? So here we got this, this one method, we're passing the JWT to this token. And this is the code here. Actually, let me just backtrack here one more. That's the code. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So this method takes the JWT, right? We got the same web client configuration here, but instead of setting the actual authorized clients, we're literally just setting the authorization header using the raw JWT, as you can see here, setting the headers. JWT get token value, right? Pretty simple, right? We're literally just relaying the token that the resource server calls to call the downstream service, right? That's literally the token relay implementation. I'm going to hand this over to Adib now. We're going to talk about the next, the next flow and the next pattern. Cool. All right. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the next thing we might want to do is we might want to exchange our tokens. So in this approach, what we're going to have is uh, we're going to have the app. It's going to call the BFF, and the BFF is going to go get its blue token from the OAuth2 server. It's going to pass that to microservice A. Microservice A is going to take that token, uh, the blue token, and send it to the OAuth2 server, and it's going to get a red token. And then it's going to take that red token and use that to call B. That's the basic idea of a bearer token exchange. Keep in mind that it's the honor system. Is, is there anything that's going to stop A from taking the blue token and calling B with it? No. <laughs> it's just you're not supposed to do that uh, if you want to implement the bearer token exchange. So you have to be, again, work with your InfoSec team, make sure that Whenever you're implementing these patterns, you've assessed all the risks to, to check that uh, it's valid. The advantage of doing this kind of uh, token exchange is to try to narrow the scopes that are uh, in the tokens so that you don't have to uh, pass it down. And that's basically the pattern. Joe, you're, you're back on. All right, do you guys want to see how to implement this with Spring Security? Yeah? Okay. Let's jump to this pattern now. I love this pattern. This is a great pattern. So let's let's take a look actually in the app just to in, you know confirm that a new access token is actually being used based on the JTI, right? So let's click on token exchange here. Same flow, same set of you know services, but just you know there's a difference between service B calling service C. So let's click on this. Now, as you can see here, I got pre previous. I had previously I had client A B C. Now it's client A B. Do you authorize scopes authority A, authority B? Right. So I'm using a new client. I'm going to authorize here. Now, let's take a look at the JTIs. Right. So we have service A calls the same tokens. Right. Now service B, as you can see, the JTI is different. Right, so it definitely is a new token, and you could also see that the 
the scopes that are attached to this token is just authority C instead of the three scopes that we had in token relay. And you could see that it's actually a different client, client C, right? Client C um, in, 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 the, in the properties file, it, I mean, it looks exactly like client ABC. The only difference is the scope setting is just authority C. That's it, literally saying I just set up another client registration with that one scope only configured. What I like about this pattern is, I mean, service C, microservice C, it only understands or supports authority C. So why would you call it with other scopes, right? It just, it doesn't make sense. Not to mention the whole, the whole security risk, security issue of that, you know, a token that has higher privileges getting leaked and being able to call multiple services. Now, if this one got leaked, right, this specific one, well, you could only call microservice C, right? So you ultimately limit your risk to that one microservice. So this whole token exchange um, pattern, and it could be implemented with in, in different ways. This specific implementation, which I'm gonna get into, is an extension grant of OAuth 2, right? So OAuth 2 defines those four standard grants, right? Implicit authorization code, client credentials, resource owner password and credentials. But there's extension grants, right? OAuth 2, it, it's all about extending from it. It's a framework, you extend from it. There's implementations based on OAuth. Everything is based off of OAuth, OpenID Connect, and the JWT bearer grant, that's the extension grant. There's an RFC out there the JWT bearer grant, in a nutshell, what this grant allows you to do, it allows you to exchange a JWT for another one, right? So in this flow, in this flow, I have a JWT coming into service B, right? This JWT was, was, uh, was authorized and, and ultimately minted to client AB, right? As we went through the flow there. And uh, in service B, it receives this access token or this JWT access token. And the flow that happens here is, okay, instead of relaying the token from service B to service C, I wanna exchange this token for another JWT with narrowed scopes, right? Very common use case, great use case. Definitely dig into this for sure um, and understand this well because this is definitely a lot more secure than token relay. All right, so definitely check that out. Let's, let's take a look at the implementation and how this is actually done. Everything's the same on the client side. The only thing I wanna show you here is the resource server side, right? So service B, token exchange controller. Now, the one thing I wanted to point out here is this actually, the JWT bearer grant implementation is not in Spring Security 5.1. This is coming in 5.2, and this is pretty much my testing ground, this sample. PR will get submitted soon. So you're gonna see a bunch of code in here that's that, that, that implements the JWT bearer grant that is gonna be gone from the sample in, in a few months. I think we're targeting 5.2, uh, I think it's May, but of course there will be a snapshot build with this implementation in probably a couple of months, if probably less. Um, but ultimately, this, this, so this specific, you know, I got this, I got this one, uh, you know, this one class JWT bearer token exchanger, right? Like I said, this is gonna be gone. Ultimately in 5.2, it's gonna be the same thing. You're gonna have a registered authorized client annotation on your controller method, just like we had with token relay, and it will automatically just perform that grant. And all you're gonna get is your authorized client, right? And then you would leverage that to make your web client call, just like I showed you in Token Relay. It's literally gonna look exactly the same. The only difference is the client registration information is gonna be different. I'm not gonna get into the code of this because, and you could definitely get into it on, on, on your own, but this will ultimately live in Spring Security 5.2. It'll be in a build snapshot um, within a month or two so you could test it earlier. The only difference would be in the client registration. Let's take a look at that, the property files, and how, how, that, how that would look like. Now I have, I have this client C exchange, 
right? That's the registration ID. I just, once again, you can name it whatever you want. I've, I've named it that, Client C Exchange for the registration ID. Everything else looks the same here. The reason I got authorization grant type client credentials there right now, because I, I just need the client registrations to validate, right? So I just kind of put that as a pl placeholder so that way it could at least um, validate when the client registration repository um, gets configured and, and boots, um, you know, reads all the properties. So that's, you know, that's why I have that kind of note there. But ultimately, um, for 5.2, what it's what it's what you really are going to be doing is this, right? That's literally going to be your client registration, right? So you're going to have your client ID, client secret, authorization grant type, and your scope. That's literally it. That's all you got to do to leverage this new feature in Spring Security 5.2. Everything else is the same. You use your registered authorized client annotation to resolve client C exchange. And this will automatically, just like if the, if the authorized client is not authorized at that, that point for authorization code, it triggers the authorization code flow. You get redirected, you go through the flow, comes back, resolves it. Client credentials, same thing. Client credentials is gonna work very similar, or works very similar, because that's my next um, demo I'm gonna talk about. It works very similar to, to this grant type, because all this grant type does is, okay, I have, I have a JWT that came in, this is a signed JWT, this is a trusted JWT because ultimately when I pass um, this JWT to the token endpoint, because that's how the JWT bearer grant works, is there is no you know, redirection to the authorization endpoint because ultimately the authorization grant is this JWT, right? Because this JWT was minted by the, the provider, it's signed and only the provider will be able to validate that. So all I gotta do is I pass the authorization grant, which is the JWT or the assertion to the token endpoint, additionally scopes, right? In this case, client, ABC on the provider can uh, is configured with authority A, authority B, authority C. That's how I have things configured on the pro on the provider. So I could I could literally just say no. You know what? I don't want the three scopes. I just want, I just want the one. So I'll pass in that scope parameter. It's, this is a token endpoint request. This is a token request. So it looks exactly the same. The only additional attributes outside of the standard OAuth to token request is the assertion attribute, which is the JWT. What comes back in that in that case is the is the OpenID Connect provider, or sorry, the or the the OAuth provider. Let's say um, will validate the JWT. Yes, th um, I signed this JWT. I minted it. We're good. Um, this client is configured for authority C. Okay, let's mint a new JWT with this narrowed scope, and it comes back right to the client, and we proceed. Right. So that's the token exchange. So literally, for 5.2, the only thing you're gonna have to do on the application side of things is the authorization grant type. You will use this specific grant type. Everything else will be the same as far as registered authorized client, you'll use that to authorize it, web client integration to make a protected resource call. Everything remains the same. It's just your specific client registration will have that specific authorization grant type. Are there any questions regards to this before we jump to the next pattern? Yes. The, the question is, is the access token cached? Yeah, so it's, it's, the, it's the authorized client, right? So when it goes through the authorization grant um, or the authorization code grant or the JWT bearer grant, like I was mentioning earlier, is the end result is an authorized client, right? And the authorized client has the associ association of a client registration the end result of that authorization, which is an access token. So what happens in this case for this specific client registration, um, client C exchange is an authorized client repository. We're gonna have a new instance. It's gonna be the client C exchange, client registration, and that new access token, All right? Yes. Yeah, no, that's a great question. The question was, 
um, the, the provider that I'm calling here and all these samples is just one provider. It's my local UAA install. The question was, can I call another provider? Yeah, you definitely can call another provider. You just got to set up that extra provider information, right? Here I have, here I have provider UAA, right? Now, if I wanted to call Google, for example, or let's say Okta, right? Because it's a lot more configurable there um, for different grants. So if I configured an Okta, um, I want to I want to be able to get an access token to call Okta APIs, then I would have, you know, provider Okta, I would define the authorization endpoint, the token endpoint, the JWK set, and so on, right? And then in the client registration information here, instead of provider UAA, it'd be provider Okta, right? So yeah, you could have many client registrations that work with many different providers, right? Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, let's, let's hand this over to Adib um, for the next, for the next uh, demo here, next set of slides. Hi, right, thanks, Joe. Thank you. Um, so the next thing we, we want to do that's common is what's typically referred to as the service principle pattern. So, um, oh, okay, I did a copy and paste and didn't change one of the bullet points. <laughs> okay. Um, so what we're doing here is, uh, is that the request goes to the BFF. The BFF is going to get its token from the OAuth2 server. And then it's going to use that to call uh, microservice A. Now, microservice A is going to now go to the OAuth server. It's not going to give it the blue token. It's going to go to the OAuth server and say, I am microservice A. My, my client ID is this. My client secret is that. Please give me a token that represents me as microservice A. And then A will call B. So from the point of B, it's not about a user calling it. It's about microservice A called it. That's the difference between like the previous one where we exchanged one token for another one. Uh, we're, we're, we're just calling as microservice A on behalf of whoever is executing it. So we don't necessarily at that point have the information about which human being was the one that actually gave permissions to call to call the service. That's the basic idea about it. Any questions about the pattern before Joe shows you how to implement this? All right, Joe, you're on. Thank you, Adib. So back to back to that 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 sample. All right, so we could go through that flow and take a look at the JTIs. We'll start there again. So the last flow here, client credentials flow, same set of services. Once again, the difference is B to C. Now let's click on this flow and let's take a look at the JTIs. As you can see, UI app to service A, service B, exact same JTI, same access token. Service B to service C, you could see it's a different JTI. So it's a different access token. The scope is similar to the GWT bearer grant. You know, it's just the one scope. But the big difference here is the subject claim. As you can see, it's client C, right? Um, the subject claim service A to service B call, I mean, that's the user. That's me, the currently authenticated user, right? But with the client credentials grant, there is no user. I mean, the client represents itself. The best example that I could give, I always use the example is, I have an inventory service, right? Do I need user context information attached to that access token when I'm calling a, gene a general service like the inventory service? No, I don't, right? And that's where you would use um, a specific client that goes through the client credentials grant to get an access token to call a general service that doesn't care about the current user like the inventory service. Now, a shopping cart service, it needs a user, right? So obviously you do need user context information or claims attached to the access token. So that's the big difference. When do you use client credentials grant compared to authorization code? Those are the kind of, you know, the, 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 the examples I like to give. Like, 
inventory servers. Give me the inventory for this product. I don't need a user for that, right? Shopping cart, well, yeah, there's a user attached here. This is what's in my shopping cart. That's the big, the big difference here. So how is this implemented in uh, Spring Security? Once again, this is also um, provided in Spring Security 5.1. And let's take a look at, let's take a look at, first we're gonna take a look at the actual application properties file. And here we have client C. And this, this is less configuration than authorization code flow, right? We have client C, we have the client credentials, client ID, client secret, authorization grant type, but the key difference I wanted to show down there is the provider, UA, token URI, JWK set URI, right? We don't have the authorization endpoint in this particular case. We don't have the user info endpoint because for the client credentials grant, which is the same for the JWT bearer grants as well, um, but we're talking about client credentials right now. A client credentials grant flow, all it does is calls the token endpoint, right? And give me an access token, right? That's, so that's all we need to configure here for this specific client and this client registration instance. So that's the configuration for a client credentials um, client. Now, how does it work? How can I, how can I take a look at um, passing the access token for a client credentials? Well, you know what? The good news is it looks exactly the same as as uh, authorization code flow, and it will look look exactly the same for JWT bearer grants. The same pattern, right? Use the registered OAuth to authorize client annotation. Specify your client, whether it's a client, it's client credentials or authorization code or JWT bear grant or whatever grants we're gonna come down the road. This is a pattern that we're really trying to stick to because obviously consistency is key and it makes things easy for you, right? So it's the same thing. We're gonna resolve this client. In the first instance, once again, um, client C is not authorized. When I try to go to this controller, right? Service B controller with that specific parameter, flow type client credentials, they'll go to this controller method and that authorized client does not exist in the authorized client repository. So automatically the client will call the token endpoint, get the access token, create an authorized client instance, save it in the repository, and then redirect back to this controller. And this time it's gonna resolve. Right? This is what happens. Actually, sorry, in, in, this, in this particular case, the, the redirect doesn't happen. That only happens for the authorization code grant. It will just resolve it and proceed to the body of the controller method. And then everything is the same as far as your, your protected resource call. I have the, the authorized client and it's that same bit of code. I just need to s supply um, the authorized client request scope attributes within the web client. That's the client credentials example. So pretty much the same, nothing really new other than the, the grant type configuration. Are there any uh, questions on that? Is it all pretty easy? Yes, no? Perfect, I like it. Yeah, uh, you guys uh, had fun so far with this? All right, so... Um we have a, a few bonus slides since it looks like we have, what, seven minutes left? Yeah. Um, so, but before we do that, honestly, any questions about any of the technical stuff? These bonus slides are not essential. Yeah, go ahead. Well, so, so yeah, so the, so the question was, did we drop the privileges for client A, B, right? And, and for, or client C calling with authority C. We didn't really drop anything. We just created a new client registration, right? Client C, right? And that client registration was configured with the one authority, right? That, that, that other client, client A, B, which was used for token exchange, and the other client, client ABC, that we used for token relay, those still reside in the authorized client repository in the UI app, right? They're just not being used in that specific controller method because I'm specifying which exact authorized client I wanna use 
for my protected resource call. Did that answer your question? Okay, so the, so so you, the question is is. Okay, so you're basically saying um, trying to uh, trying to understand more of the token exchange pattern. So in the token, this one here. So you're saying what's the point of doing token exchange? No, I'm, I'm asking myself if I get a token, a blue token. Yeah. Uh, I send it to the OAuth server. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does the blue token contain everything that the red token? Oh, okay. So the question is, the blue token, does it contain everything that the red token has? The answer, no, it doesn't need to. The blue token should just have whatever you need to call microservice A. It shouldn't know anything about that. So the, you've configured your OAuth to provider, your OpenID Connect provider to say, when I give you a blue token that looks like this, give me back a red token that has all this extra stuff in it which didn't exist in the blue token. So it wasn't that like it's giving you the red token because the blue token had extra stuff in it. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Um, all right, anybody want the yeah, bonus we, slides? We got some more questions here. Oh, go ahead. Dieter, right? Yeah. Yes, I remember your name. How you doing? Does the providers offer this functionality? The token exchange? Yeah. Good question. Um, obviously, UAA offers GWT Bear Grant. Um, you know what? The to the, there's a there's an RFC token exchange, which is different from GWT Bear Grant. Although you could do a token exchange with GWT Bear Grant. So that token exchange RFC, it's it's still early in the stages in in, this, in the RFC process. So we're definitely going to implement it, but it's it's got to proceed a little bit further um, in the process. And our other providers implementing it, there's no doubt they will. Which ones are implementing it right now? Not sure. Um, uh, yeah, I can't answer that question, but it'd probably be, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Octo's maybe doing an initial implementation of it, but it's, it's early in the RFC process as far as the token exchange RFC goes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Go ahead. Yeah. No, yeah, that, that that doesn't get passed. That scope underscore that doesn't get passed during token relay. What gets passed is exactly the JWT that came in, which only has authority A, right? That scope prefix is only resolved into the authentication authorities list, like that. So it doesn't collide with potentially other authorities. And just to give it an indication that these authorities are derived from the scope attribute of the GWT. But yeah, the question is, this, or the answer is the scope, pre, uppercase scope underscore, that does not get relayed um, to uh, the downstream service during a token relay pattern. It's the exact token that came in untouched. Yep, great. Any other questions? Okay, well. Bonus light time then. Yes, <laughs> go for it. All right, so um, I have three slides and uh, two and a half minutes, so it'll be pretty fast. So if you are going to do microservices, you probably wanna do a platform. So I'm gonna show you what Cloud Foundry can do for you if you're doing microservices and you want to secure them. So one, uh, option number one, so if you're running on Cloud Foundry, you can have your, there's a thing called the route service, whereby you can have your code running in a container over here, where the app is. Request comes, goes through a load balancer, like your typical uh, infrastructure load balancer, gets to the Cloud Foundry router that actually knows where your containers are with your code in them. And there, the router can say, great, I want to send that request to a route service that could be like an API gateway. And this route service would then send it back, will process it, might do things like take the opaque token and validate it and all that type of stuff. If the request should continue on, it'll go back to the load balancer, back to the Cloud Foundry router, and onto your app. So that's pattern number one. Pattern number two that you can do on platforms is what's called container-to-container -container networking. Uh, and in this pattern, what we do is we basically say, okay, by default, when I launch a Linux container that's running my app on Cloud Foundry, 
I'm going to allow application A to talk to application B. Default, nobody's allowed to talk to anybody. You can only receive requests from the outside world, process those requests, and return them. So you can actually ask Cloud Foundry for things like, hey, application A should allow calls out to destination B, and on B, you have to say, I'm, I'm allowing requests from application A. And this is at the level of the application. There's no IP addresses um, or any infrastructure-specific settings. You're logically describing who's allowed to talk to who, and that will then be enforced at the level of the network by Cloud Foundry, which is pretty awesome, because now you're getting like pretty tight micro-segmentation of, of what's happening. The last thing, which is pretty neat, is, is, uh, is that when Cloud Foundry creates containers for you, it actually assigns a, and generates a unique public-private key pair that identifies that container instance. So if I take one app, uh, one microservice, and I scale it to 10 containers, I have 10 separate private-public key pairs that identify each one of those instances. And those key pairs are actually rotated every 24 hours or uh, shorter if your administrators choose to do so. So what this would make it uh, possible for you to do if you want to do mutual TLS between all the different microservices and you happen to be running on Cloud Foundry, boom, you got all the certificates you need to be able to do mutual TLS very easily and those certificates get rotated. Pretty sweet. And that's pretty it. That's pretty much it. Uh, thanks so much. We're, it's, it's an honor for us to be here. It's great to, you know, went from watching DevOps videos on YouTube to actually being on stage. So I'm pretty excited about that. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. The one last thing I wanted to point out, so, um, so this sample, there it is. And we've actually put together a lot of documentation on the new OAuth support and OpenID Connect. Please check it out. All the links are over here. OAuth2 client, OAuth2 login, resource server, all the samples, everything we've produced so far as far as documentation and samples is right there, right? And we're definitely making sure that we're documenting every single feature that we do in OAuth 2 client and resource, just OAuth in general. So it's a lot easier for you guys. And you probably don't like reading documentation too much, but please check it out. There's a lot of code samples there. Thank you.